Hello, and thank you for coming, watching, and listening in to the forum at the Harvard School of Public Health. I'm Bob Oakes of 90.9 WBUR, Boston's NPR news station. Today's session is the Boston Marathon Bombings, Lessons Learned for Saving Lives. It's presented in collaboration with WBUR. To welcome us, please allow me to introduce Julio Frank, Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. Dean. Thank you, Bob, for that introduction. And thanks to WBUR uh, for collaborating with the Harvard School of Public Health on today's forum. We have appreciated the station's reporting and coverage, which has kept our community so well informed. On behalf of the entire Harvard School of Public Health community, I wanted to take a moment at the beginning of today's event to extend our deepest sympathy to the victims of the violence at the marathon and its aftermath, as well as to thank all the first responders and law enforcement, state, federal, and local, for their heroism. I also wanted to thank our panelists for being here and thank Mary Clark, Director of the Emergency Preparedness Bureau at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, who has joined us today. Last week was one we will not soon forget. There were many tragedies which we've heard about over the last few days. Lives have been forever altered by these senseless acts. Yet within such a painful time for this community, we are hearing about real heroes among us and many positive examples of collaboration and efficiency within hospitals and across city, state, and federal agencies. In the face of such an unspeakable act of violence, there are valuable lessons which I, I hope we can all learn from. Today, we hear from our panelists to start to piece together not just the events of last week, but the lessons of last week. Times like this call us all to pull closer, to support one another, and to work even harder for peace and goodwill, not only in Boston, but throughout the global community. I thank everyone who has cho chosen to join us, both in our studio and online, and look forward to an enlightened discussion about the lessons learned in Boston. Thank you, Dean Frank. Let me introduce our panelists as we begin. To my immediate left, James Hooley, the Chief of Boston Emergency Medical Services. And thank you all for being here today. Paul Bittinger, Chief of the Division of Emergency Preparedness for Mass General Hospital, Paul. Judy Ann Bigby, for Bigby former Massachusetts Secretary of Health and Human Services, Judy. Uh, and Lenny Marcus, co-director of National Preparedness Leadership Institute. Lenny, good to see you today. We hope to have joining us a little later, Don Boyce, director of the Office of Emergency Management for the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. He'll be joining us remotely from Washington. Uh, and as the dean said, Mary Clark, the director of emergency preparedness, the Bureau for the State Department of Public Health is with us in our studio audience. Let me recap, if I might, just briefly the events of the last two weeks which bring us here today. On Monday, April 15th, a holiday in Massachusetts, Patriots Day, several hours into the world-renowned Boston Marathon, a pair of bombs exploded seconds apart near the crowded finish line. Three people died, including an eight-year-old boy. Over 250 other people were injured. Largely thanks to security cameras in the area, two suspects were identified within days, Photos of the pair were released to the public, and just a day later, the pair allegedly shot and killed a Massachusetts Institute of Technology police officer. One of the suspects was killed following a police chase. An unprecedented lockdown then followed as authorities asked almost one million citizens of Greater Boston on almost 100 square miles of urban area to stay in their homes while the search ensued. It was called a shelter-in-place request. The suspect was found and captured within a day when a resident found him bleeding and hiding in a boat in a backyard. At present, he's hospitalized and will presumably face trial. We're here today to talk about the lessons already learned from what happened at the marathon finish line, where response to the blasts was remarkable and immediate. Before the smoke left the ground, first responders, volunteers, and citizens all leapt into action, helping the wounded. 
Some of the injured were seriously hurt. They were burned. There were blast injuries, single and double amputations, horrible injuries usually reserved for the battlefield. And yet there is general acceptance that the loss of life could have and would have been worse had responders not acted quickly and had hospitals not been ready. And that is what we're here to talk about this morning, lessons learned. So let me start by going to Jim first. First-hand account of marathon response for you that day. Well, our, <clears throat> our marathon plan is, uh, is something that's evolved over the years. I mean, it's, what was it? it was the 113th running of the, uh, the race. And so we've had a lot of experience that we've, we've gathered over the years, how to uh, staff up adequately so that we can support the runners, the spectators, make sure that uh, the Boston hospitals don't get overrun uh, with, uh, with patients, uh, to make sure we deliver uh, service to our neighborhoods, which we have an obligation to do, who uh, have nothing to do with the race. So, you know, a lot of our staffing is built up around that. Uh, we plan for a lot of the obvious things you might expect, uh, the, you know, the dehydrations, the hyperthermias, the hyponatremias, the, the kind of events that we've seen over the years at marathons, uh, sudden, sudden death from runners, and, and uh, you know, we've had good success uh, dealing with that. Uh, we work uh, very close with the, uh, with the medical community who supply uh, a lot of medical volunteers in the uh, tents there, which do an awful lot of that on-site treatment that, that keeps EMS from me now having to deliver all these patients to emergency rooms, which uh, you know, really wouldn't be uh, fair to everyone else. Uh, so the plans were in place for that, uh, which called for us to staff, uh, we had an additional 13 ambulances down and around the assigned to this event and uh, also, uh, which means we had about 95 additional personnel on scene, including our medical director and her associate medical directors. So we were in a, a pretty good position, uh, you know, uh, leaning forward, for lack of a better term, when this started. Uh, the day was unfolding, like a lot of marathons in the past, and, uh, but uh, mercifully, it was a lot better up, up before the explosions than last year. Uh, you know, last year was the year that was particularly warm, there were about 10 percent of the field of 25,000 became some sort of casualty, and we were, you know, we uh, we we were stressed last year. But the system, again, same system here that we're all talking about today, you know, flexed and worked for that. Uh, you know, this year we were uh, just prior to the uh, b bombs going off, uh, we were taking a look around, and that's the main medical tent was only at about half full capacity. Uh, our secondary tent, which was down in uh, Park Square, was, was full, but it was about, it's only a quarter of the size. Uh, and we, the acuity wasn't bad. It was actually almost a time you could say, like, wow, we're having an easy year. And uh, it was, you know, shortly after that, we, we heard the first explosion. Uh, Where were you at that moment? I was uh, at the rear of the uh, Alpha, our main medical tent at uh, Dartmouth and uh, St. James. And what was your first reaction when you heard the explosion? It was loud. It was, I knew, obviously, I didn't know it was a bomb, but I, I had a, a terrible feeling that it might be, only because of the sound was different than anything I've heard growing up living in the city. It wasn't a piece of heavy equipment falling. I thought maybe, maybe. Uh, it was, uh, you know, there's some vendors and some cooking, maybe a propane tank or something went off, which would have been bad enough. And, you know, I was worried about injuries. And then before you had uh, another two seconds to process that, we heard the second explosion, which then left no doubt, and then we just started responding. And what was your first response? Our first response was to listen up on the radio because we did have... Uh, uh, folks in unified command posts all around up in uh, up at Meme or up at State up in Framingham. We had folks at the uh, Boston Police uh, Command Center. We had uh, folks on scene come here, so we knew we could, we really wanted to start getting information right away as far as uh, uh, threat and uh, size of the situation. Plus, we also we had when I talked about the 90 plus folks that we had working that day, uh, many of them were foot teams. We had people at the finish line with stretches, proceed out teams that could go into the crowd and, and extract somebody. We had uh, EMTs and paramedics on uh, bicycles along the course. We had uh, uh, folks on uh, with golf carts with, you know, and, and they all had jump bags which had, you know, dressings, tourniquets, but, you know, D 
defibrillators and oxygen because in a typical marathon we want to be able to get in quickly grab somebody who's down and extract them back to either uh, an ambulance that they can get into a side street or bring them back to the medical tent depending what the situation is. So we had a lot of eyes on the course right then and uh, we, we started getting immediate reports back that, uh, from our personnel on the radio that they had yeah, there had definitely been two, I mean, uh, the, one of the first supervisors come on and said, he said, we have just had two devices detonate. So, so you know, it wasn't uh, anything but that was completely uh, confirmed for us at that point. Uh, and that we had multiple uh, persons down. Uh, you know, at that point, uh, trying to get the system uh, uh, ready to, to receive patients, we did put out a, uh, we did request that all Boston hospitals uh, be notified of a mass casualty situation to expect multiple trauma patients. And we also said, uh, uh, obviously told Alpha to, to gear up for that. And, and Alpha. The main medical, a, tent A, I'm sorry. Right. Um, it, uh, because it's, it's laid out uh, it, very well for, you know, for the dehydration, for the people cramping up, for people, you know, there's areas to rapidly cool people, there's areas to rapidly warm people, uh, depending what's going in. There's, there's an ICU set aside, there's an asthma bay. It's met up mostly to manage what we typically see at an event. It, it quickly was transitioning uh, with the help of uh, uh, the, the volunteers, as well as some of our associate uh, medical directors, one who's a, you know an Army vet and still uh, uh, has deployed overseas, Dr. Q, to start breaking that up into a, a, a red, yellow, and green, green treatment areas. Uh, so they started Red being the most red serious being the injured. Most, yeah, critical, yellow, urgent, people that uh, can go out after we get the uh, people who need uh, life-saving treatment. And there were, and there were unfortunately, uh, many people who fit into the red category that day. Yes, there were. Uh, we had, uh, you know, listening to CMED, which is the uh, 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 portion of our dispatch, uh, our, we, we maintain a call entry and dispatch for EMS in Boston. We're up at the Boston Police Headquarters. We have an area there uh, called Boston CMED where we, you know, you routinely you coordinate patches to hospitals, get medical control for orders for a complicated case. And, uh, but in this case, uh, we, well, again, we're fortune favored us because the hospitals were all staffed up because the marathon's a busy day. And they were, uh, we were able to quickly bring them all up online so they could listen. Let me get a couple of quick observations from the field, if I, mo uh, uh, from the field, if I might and ask a couple of uh, the, the EMTs who were on duty that day to uh, give us their observations. I want to start right here in the, in the middle, right in, right in the middle, yes, please. Why don't you tell us your name? My name is Paul Hughes. I'm a paramedic with the city of Boston. Where were you and what happened to you? Uh, I was actually at the rear of the medical tent. I was uh, one of three other, two other paramedics and two EMTs. We were the treatment area for that uh, back area. So we had already had some minor respiratory problems going on, so we were treating people with, uh, uh, for asthma. Um, and they were, they were mild respiratory, they were actually clearing up nicely and working with the physicians. Again, we were treating them, stabilizing them, fixing them, and then sending them back to meet up with their family. So I had actually three people on breathing treatments when we heard the first uh, detonation. And when the first explosion occurred, did you stay in the tent and wait for trauma patients to come in to you, or did you go out into the field and seek them? No, out? I, I had to stay with the three people I was already responsible for, uh -huh. so, but we all quickly knew what was gonna trans, transition into, and, and it, also the patients recognized this was something bad getting ready to happen. And so I was trying to keep them calm, continue their treatment, um, and then, uh, yeah, we were transitioning that area to receive casualties. All right, the, the fellow next to you, if I might, you were also in the field that day? Yes, sir. Why don't you take the microphone and tell us who you are, please? I'm Lieutenant Brian Pomodoro, Boston EMS, and I was a safety officer on duty that day. Uh, I was approximately around the center of that alpha tent, like the chief was talking, uh, discussing near the finish line, when the first blast went off. And uh, as he said, we, anyone who grew up in the city, we looked at each other saying, that's not the typical city sound you hear. Then the second blast we heard. Now, as the safety officer, I knew it was going to happen. I knew my personnel were going to be running to the scene. So uh, I actually went to get my personal protective gear first and then go to the scene. And sure enough, uh, I turned the corner and all I saw was our personnel running into the smoke and the haze, if you would, uh, trying to just grab victims. 
quickly as possible. The biggest thing on my mind there was we already heard two explosions. One was very loud, one was somewhat muffled. We didn't know at that point if there was a third or perhaps a fourth one. And these uh, extra devices are meant purposely to kill responders, whereas the initial blast will go off, people go rushing in to help, that second blast go, uh, will detonate and then take out responders or anyone else who went in. That was primarily on my mind at the time, was doing a survey for the extra devices. And uh, sure enough, we did find something that was suspicious under the stands, and the medical director, Dr. Dyer, was actually right there and made the decision as well, yes, stop treatments here drag people to the tent, whatever manner, it doesn't matter, get them to the tent, we have to get out of here. And it uh, turned out not to be a suspicious device, is that correct? Well, it will always be suspicious, but it right. turned out not to be an explosive device, though, right. yes, correct. Right. Can I, would you ask, uh, a answer a question for me? Uh, one of the first things I saw that day, like m most people, I'm sure, uh, w were, if you weren't in the city, you were watching it on TV. And the first thing that you saw when the blast went off were some people running in the other direction but first responders running right into the smoke, running right into the smoke, clambering over the barricades, tearing them down, trying to get at the injured people within moments. W what is it that drives first responders in that direction when so many other people are going the opposite way? I'd better answer that question, ask my wife. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're the one, really, the piece, uh, our spouses and coworkers, you know, they know, uh, an emergency responder is just that. Uh, we don't have the pleasure or the luxury of assessing a scene to extreme, at least. We are taught to do a scene size up in perhaps the first eight to 10 seconds. Uh, in this situation, this was strictly an instinct where I see hurt people, and you can't turn your head to hurt people. Uh, you know, there are plenty of people who were, again, that's why bystanders, I think, kicked into that mode, too. These people had no medical training whatsoever, but they saw hurt people, and they knew, I, I'm going to lend some comfort here. Uh, some people were just holding jackets over people to keep them warm, and I, I can tell you how much that helps, knowing that uh, a lot of the victims were telling me in the tent later on, I transitioned to the tent afterwards, that just someone holding their hand or, getting them, or keeping them warm actually did comfort them. Let me come to the hospitals. Paul. Uh, let me ask you, for first-hand account of marathon response from the hospital point of view, when did you find out something was uh, uh, going wrong, horribly wrong, uh, and that your team was going to get called uh, into service? We, uh, we first got a page from Boston EMS, uh, or a, a radio alert, I guess, uh, at about uh, uh, five minutes until three. Um, and that's when we first heard of the explosions, and, and we were told, as the chief said, to start to prepare for casualties. Um, I was not actually in the emergency department at the time, so my uh, department paged it out to me. So I looked at my pager, and, and it said multiple explosions uh, at the uh, at the marathon finish line. Um, and I have to say that I, I didn't really believe it. Uh, it's it's one of those things that you don't expect actually to ever see happen for real. And it took took me a second to read it again and and, and confirm that that really was the the text that I was given. Um, the department uh, swung into action very, very quickly. Um, fortunately, uh, we've done a lot of planning, uh, a lot of training, uh, and, and frankly, we've tried to learn a lot of lessons for events like these. Uh, we know that we have very little time to prepare. Um, I have a 49-bed emergency department, uh, which is uh, among the larger emergency departments, uh, but we had 91 patients in the department when we first got the page uh, that the event went off. So what do you do with them? Well, it really uh, highlights that this is a whole hospital response. Uh, we called the medical floors, we called our admitting office, uh, and we sent patients upstairs who were in uh, partial states of workup in the emergency department. Normally, uh, we like to work them up, really have a diagnosis and a treatment plan established, um, we didn't have that luxury, and so uh, our medical uh, teams were remarkable just taking patients on the floors and continuing what was an emergency department evaluation. Um, and we had 30 people go upstairs within about 20 minutes, uh, which is really unprecedented. What was triage like when the first of the, the bombing victims came into the hospital emergency room? Well, uh, the first couple, uh, there wasn't much triage to be done. We actually set our, our plan in motion the way we planned to. We put uh, some nurses and physicians up front with some, some resources, but the first five, six patients that arrived were so obviously critical uh, there was nothing to do uh, but but r usher them straight into the resuscitation bays. There was no question of, of what level of acuity they, they were. 
um, those patients were brought in, uh, we'd mobilize trauma teams and because we were able to open up uh, sufficient rooms to resuscitate the patients and we called down uh, emergency department, surgical, uh, other resources, we actually were able to run five, six uh, simultaneous resuscitations. Uh, and the first patients were so uh, severely injured that five people left the emergency department and went to the operating room with eight, within eight minutes of one another. Uh, because the, the, it was so time sensitive to get those operations uh, started. And as the afternoon went on, were all uh, of your units fully occupied? Uh, they weren't, uh, interestingly. Uh, as I mentioned, we sent a lot of people upstairs uh, making room for, uh, for the disaster. Um, we had extra capacity that could have been used if it were needed. Uh, I'm very thankful it wasn't needed, obviously. but. Um, one of the things that happens in events like these is you just don't have good information. Uh, we spent a long time uh, trying to figure out how many more potential victims there were, whether there were more devices. Uh, this is uh, the natural state of, of uh, a terrorist bombing like this, that, um, that the information flow is very hard to come by. Uh, we worked very well with uh, Boston EMS, uh, with the Boston Public Health Commission that runs a medical intelligence center uh, that actually coordinates information for us, uh, with the State Department of Public Health, and they were very helpful in confirming uh, some information for us, dispelling rumors. Uh, but it really wasn't until maybe an hour and a half or two later that we started to feel comfortable we could start to stand down parts of our response uh, that it wasn't going to be needed. As you look back on it, uh, what, what, uh, what was the benefit or what was the impact on the emergency room response to having uh, so many medical personnel out in the field already? Um, there's no question that for some of the people that, that made it our way, it was life-saving. Uh, some people had hemorrhage control, had, had either bystanders, volunteer uh, medical uh, professionals, or uh, assigned medical professionals jump in right at the moment that, uh, that, the, in uh, that the impact uh, happened. And when you say uh, hemorrhage control, you mean uh, improvised tourniquets on I, some of the I, 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 Well, some was just as, as simple as direct pressure, people that just pushed on a bleeding vessel. Uh, tourniquets were absolutely used in life-saving, some formal tourniquets, some makeshift tourniquets. Uh, but, but there were a number of people that arrived at my emergency department, and I know from other conversations, other emergency departments, ha had they not had those interventions, they would have died, no question. All right, let me come uh, back to the audience, if I might, and uh, pass the microphone down to Mary Clark, please. Thank you very much. Uh, M Mary, uh, the role of the state and your team at, the, at this moment or the moment of incidents like this, describe it if you would. Sure. Um, so for the marathon, we always staff up for the marathon so that we can get information from the tents along the route, from the hospitals along the route. We also have staff at the medical tents at the end because partly what we do is gather information and push it out to the hospitals. Um, we also treat the marathon every year as an exercise in a mass casualty event. So for this marathon, we had 16 staff along the route and in hospitals along the route, and we had two staff at the medical tents at the end. We also had staff at the State Emergency Operations Center that oversees health and medical activities, and we had staff at our Departmental Operations Center. So from our staff who were at the medical tents, um, immediately after the explosions, we got a call at the State Emergency Operations Center from them saying there have been explosions at the finish line. Um, and that was within a minute of the explosion. Um, that information comes back to us at the operations center, and within nine minutes, I think, we got notices out. COBETH, which is the conference of Boston teaching hospitals, um, used our web-based alerting system to get messages to the Boston hospital, and we used it to get messages to the hospitals in the area around Boston to let them know there were explosions, there was a mass casualty event. We would be providing additional information to them. And our role at that point, besides getting information out, was in part trying to squash rumors. There's a lot of information going around. There was a lot of information on the media. So as we got questions from hospitals about what was happening or whether there were lockdowns or there were other devices, a key part of our role is searching out that information and finding it out and then sharing it with all of the hospitals. What was the most troubling rumor that you had to squash? Um, there were a lot of rumors about uh, additional devices um, so trying to get information from the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security and the State Police about that. There were information that some hospitals weren't accepting patients. There were information, um, all of the rumors that start up that, that begin to make people question whether they can get care 
or um, make hospitals wonder what's going on. So um, we had staff that was tracking down all of that information and getting back to the, inf to the institution that heard the, the myth um, and then sending information widely around. Um, our web-based system, which is called the HAN, the Health and Homeland Alert Network, um, I think the initial message that went out to hospitals reached 400 um, different recipients from the Boston hospitals and the hospitals around so that they all got exactly the same message at exactly the same time so that they were working from the same um, scenario. All right, Judy and Bigby, uh, y you've worked closely with Mary in the past. Uh, tell us about how the state goes about helping to design an emergency system, especially the one that was deployed after these bombings. So I think um, one of the key things is knowing who the point person is. And Director Clark, Mary was the point person for these types of emergencies um, for our agency. And she's already emphasized why that is so important making sure that people are getting the appropriate communication and not acting on rumor or things that might be misreported in the media. Um, also, making sure that, you know, in a situation like this, you know that there are going to be medical casualties. There are other issues that people are facing. A whole bunch of people didn't have a place to go and live for a while. Uh, making sure that the agencies can respond to that, um, making sure that as um, this uh, type of thing progresses during um, the time period that was involved, that the downstream effects of uh, casualties uh, or the emergency like that are planned for in such a way that uh, they're anticipated and not that they come up suddenly. And, and what do you mean by downstream effects? So, beyond, beyond shelter? Well, um, there might be people who um, didn't have access to their health insurance information. So making sure that there was a way to help them with that type of thing. Um, the biggest thing is um, the phases of counseling that people will need um, acutely maybe right on the scene or directly after this on the scene, um, the sort of recovery phase of that, uh, not only for the victims, but then um, there's a whole bunch of first responders and their families and others um, who may need counseling. And we have the, the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Public Health, the Boston Public Health Commission actually have staff who are trained to do that uh, and to respond to these types of traumas and make sure that they get out in the field um, at the appropriate time to do that. All right, D uh, Don Boyce, let me bring you into the conversation, joining us remotely from Washington. Thank you very much. Uh, your firsthand account of the Boston uh, experience and what's the federal perspective on what happened in the early hours that day? Well, for us, the the federal engagement is always in support of uh, state and locals. So um, the, the federal role really is to partner with state and local communities in their preparedness and during training. And then we take a role in support of state and local communities during a response and ultimate recovery. So we were engaged early on to offer whatever support might have been needed. And we stayed engaged throughout to offer support um, at the recovery stage with regard to mental health, and there are many services that come in, obviously FEMA as the lead agency for emergency management, but health and human services under an emergency support function, um, and through our partners at CDC and SAMHSA and the Assistant Secretary for Health, it's, it's really a full gamut of services that we can provide in support of state and local uh, emergency response and, and support services. All right. Lenny Marcus, when you look at this a little bit from the outside, uh, do you see a system that worked the way it was planned to work? Well, thank you, Bob. For those people who are watching this across the country and around the world, there are many lessons to learn from Boston, especially for those of you who work in areas of preparedness and response. Uh, buses around our community have on their destination sign, Boston Strong. And in many ways, our colleagues have demonstrated here a standard 
that we hope will be replicated if, God forbid, this should happen in other communities. So your job is building Chicago strong or building Houston strong or building Arizona strong so that what we've seen here and the saving of lives that we've seen here can be replicated in other communities. We've had the pleasure of working with our colleagues over the years, and there have been a number of things that have, that have brought us to this day. One of them is there was a tremendous investment in training. So as people described, and as we've heard many stories here in Boston, when the bombs went off, um, people on the streets, uh, first responders, the hospitals, uh, law enforcement, everyone knew what to do, and they were trained and they were ready to work together. We have an expression here uh, called meta leadership, and that's leaders truly working together. And in your preparing and in your championing this kind of leadership, it's really about your it. You have that responsibility, and when the moment comes, you have to be able to engage your system so that the kind of saving lives that we've seen here can be replicated in your community. Another thing that we've seen here, there's been a lot of talk about resilience. And there was resilience in this community from the first moment. What, what do you mean by that, Lenny, if I might ask? Well, there were people who were in shock in, that, uh, in those first moments when the bombs fir first went off. And people describe, witnesses describe, a moment of just being in a freeze. And they instantly got out of that freeze. They ran to the scene. They were resilient. They helped in saving lives. And today, in Boston, where those explosions occurred, people are already walking the sidewalks. Businesses are back in play. The community has been resilient. Nine days after the event, the sidewalks have been repaired. The community has come back to life. And so, again, a Boston standard. We've talked about what resilience means. We've seen resilience in the first moments. We've seen resilience of survivors. Um, over this period, and we're seeing resilience in a community that really demonstrates what strong is all about. Chief, let me come back to you, if I might. Uh, w w what advice uh, would you have for other EMS chiefs at this moment, uh, and preparedness uh, and response officials uh, in other large cities? Uh, well, I guess let's start off by saying that oh, we've I mean, we've been fortunate over the last dozen or so years, actually going back to even the Oklahoma City bombings back in 95 at the uh, Gamara building, that it's, whenever we've had new training initiatives, whenever we had chances to, uh, to, uh, to, to, f to fund different training, uh, one of the lessons you always, they tell us, and I'll tell you, is it's not a, uh, a question of if, but when. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to, uh, it, it's hard times, it's hard to really accept that. And, uh, but it was always in the back of your mind that, well, I just want to make sure we're ready when, when God forbid, our time comes. And so, I mean, so my first uh, bit of advice, I guess, would be that y you have to think about that. You have to think that it's going to happen uh, at the, uh, uh, the most innocuous place like uh, the theater in Aurora, uh, Colorado, uh, you know, what happened at the, uh, the great school in Connecticut, and then what happened to us here in Boston. So it's... You almost have to be ready to imagine the unimaginable. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you freeze and you, you cower. What you do is you, you, you train your personnel, you equip them, uh, you make sure that uh, you have enough personnel. Uh, we, we were, uh, I, I tell these other communities too, to uh, make sure you, you, you have enough ambulances. What, one of the key things that I think that, that led to, some, that, to the outstanding survival in Boston, um, and, you know, and one for just, Personal note: I just really want to praise the, the folks who work in my department. Who, I mean, they they've received accolades, and so I'm not just going to keep. It. They're 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 a little red right now in the front yeah. row. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, they 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 have they have bought into the uh, the notion that you have to repair, you have you 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 have to drill, you have to imagine this kind of scenario even when you're doing your 280 other routine calls during the day, that uh, you have to be ready for when, that, for when that occurs. Have that annex in your playbook if you're covering whatever the event is in, in, in your community. Uh, you know, we all have you know, annexes for when the tornado's coming or if we're worried about lightning or if we're worried about uh, you know, maybe hazmats and, and stuff. So, but we have to uh, make sure that we keep that, uh, that ability to quickly respond to the active shooter, the bombing, uh, keep it in our
playbook and ready to go so that when it does happen, it becomes muscle memory for our folks. Once they get over that initial shock, which we all encountered, uh, it, uh, so they can transition into that. I, I have to ask you, I, I know it's still very, very fresh, mm -hmm. uh, but w as you look back, what's the greatest lesson learned, do you think, for the Boston Department for you? Well, I think, the, I mean, one of the things that we, in Boston, Massachusetts, the, uh, the whole community that was involved in this, uh, but particularly for the, uh, the folks and uh, professionals in EMS, and particularly the, the privates who also come in to assist us, uh, was, so far, you know, the, the, the fact that anybody who arrived alive at a Boston hospital is still alive today. And that's, you know, that's, that's, we, we, we do mourn the victims and we do feel bad. I mean, we, in the, in the people who are surviving, who are going to have lifelong challenges in front of them, that, that's ingrained in us. So we're not diminishing their suffering at all when we, when we say that, but we do take uh, 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 pride in having part of that. I think some of the, uh, Probably the biggest takeaway from that was the fact when you talk about those first 30 critical patients out of the 90 that you know we can have records of that we got transported out of there within 30 minutes. Those first 30, they were probably in hospitals in like within 15 to 18 minutes, and uh, so there was quick rec uh, early recognition of what was going on. There wasn't a whole lot of fancy or elaborate care. It was life-saving stuff, hemorrhage control, uh, up to including tourniquets. Uh, open an airway, you know, assist people, load them, get a destination and go. Double up the ambulance, you know, double up people in the truck, or if you have to put uh, four in, get your designation and go. Uh, being able to maintain that discipline over and over again with other partners coming in uh, and, and, just, and just, just being able to spread that. I think that was probably the best thing. So I think that anybody who, uh, who had a chance, who didn't just need an emergency room, but needed an operating room, uh, they they got there, and I think that's uh, being able to have a system where you can prioritize that and save the most people who who uh, are capable of being saved. I think is the most uh, valuable lesson. Paul, lessons for the hospitals. I, I think it's a couple. Um, <coughs> I think Boston has a has a history of planning collaboratively for disaster that is longer than most cities in the United States. We've had a, a disaster planning committee uh, among the Boston hospitals since the 1980s. Uh, that uh, has included representatives from EMS, from, from local public health. And uh, the fact that we've planned together uh, means that we know each other's capabilities uh, and it means we know each other's plans. Uh, but I think very most importantly, it means we've practiced together. And, and it's probably the single most, I think, important factor in the hospital's response. Um, hospitals practice their emergency plans regularly. We practice it with EMS, we practice it with each other. Um, and if, uh, if I had tried to ask each of the people in, in my uh, emergency department in my hospital to do the individual tasks uh, requested of them from a top-down, from a command leadership, uh, without them knowing it ahead of time, we never would have been able to respond as quickly. Um, because people have been through exercise after ex exercise, they know where they're supposed to stand, they know what they're supposed to do, and we can do Herculean tasks like moving 30 patients out of an emergency department, taking five in, sending eight to the operating room, things that, that normally are very, very hard. Um, I think, uh, again, as, as uh, Chief Hooley said, uh, his department did an absolutely remarkable job of distributing the patients among the hospitals. Uh, as far as I'm aware, one of the, the first instances where distribution of patients among trauma centers among hospitals was successful uh, in a modern uh, bombing event. Uh, in most all incidents, the closest, hos closest hospital gets overwhelmed, uh, and that really limits the ability to care for patients. His department did a phenomenal job of distributing the patients, and then it was our task to be just as quick um, in getting them the definitive care they needed. I, I'm wondering, given our audience uh, uh, out there, well outside of Austin, what advice you would have for uh, doctors uh, and hospitals and healthcare providers who are listening to this, uh, wondering at this moment uh, what they should be doing to prepare, knowing perhaps that some of them uh, have hardly done any, any preparation at all for a major event. Sure. I, I think uh, I'm always surprised when I talk to people uh, about disasters, uh, how few people know their own institution's emergency operations plan. Um, and uh, they may say, I don't know what my role is and I don't know what my plan is. Uh, I would strongly encourage them to make connections with 
an emergency manager at their hospital in their practice uh, and, and learn what the plan is. Uh, and more importantly, I'd encourage them to participate in exercises. If they're not exercising very much uh, at their hospital or in their practice, uh, I would encourage them to exercise more. The, the basics of medical care, uh, what's required of medical professionals, um, are still the basics of medical care. Um, we say in emergency medicine, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. As the chief said, keeping someone's airway open, make sure they're breathing, and control the, her the, the hemorrhage, control the bleeding so that their circulation is preserved, that's what it takes to save lives. And medical professionals from EMTs to paramedics to nurses to physicians, no matter what they do in their daily practice, understand that. Um, what they need to know is how they fit into the system. Um, we were really fortunate that uh, on top of all the wonderful medical responders that were volunteers that, that helped at the finish line, we had a system that took it from there, that transported the patients where they needed to go, the hospitals uh, activated plans that were very successful. Um, if you uh, are sitting at home and wondering what you maybe should be doing uh, if something uh, happens around you, know where you fit into your system, know what's expected of you. Uh, the basics of medical care are, are still the basics of medical care. Lenny, this doesn't work as well, uh, and it might not necessarily work as well uh, everywhere else. So w what happens in communities that aren't as well trained and aren't as well coordinated uh, as the city of Boston? Or I should say, what can happen there? Well, it was very clear that there was no one agency or no one hospital that was going to be able to handle this huge event on its own. And one of the things that we've seen here in Boston, and again, it's something that came out of training and a lot of work beforehand, is that leaders of these different agencies and the different hospitals really came together. There was extraordinary collaboration. We saw it in the law enforcement community, and you know, one of the um, one of the observations is it's rare to see a Boston police squad in Watertown and Boston police working there. And there was such a spirit of cooperation um, across the different agencies and within the political leadership and the subject matter experts and the citizens. And everyone pulled together. And I think that it was no accident. You know, sometimes say it was really fortunate that it happened at the end of the, uh, uh, of the Boston Marathon. I think it was intentional that there were these sorts of resources that were there and that people were ready and that there was an instant collaboration and in part because leaders had been working together first off to build their own connectivity and second off to ensure that um, their staff were ready uh, and able to roll together when it when it mattered most. But but Don, let me ask you this question. W without question, in other communities uh, and in other states, uh, parochialism exists, uh, territorialism between services, between agencies, between governments exists. So how do you break that down? It, you're right. It exists during normal business work hours. But the people that you see in front of you and the effort that that we have undertaken over decades is that during practice and during response time, we, we come together as one. So it's not business as usual when something bad happens. And the people, the professionals that you have on that panel and the people that are out in the field and the emergency managers that Lenny was just referring to are all trained in a way where we understand and appreciate the fact that no one can do it alone. There are cities that work to their resources are done and then the states come in to help them until their resources are done. And then the federal government is poised to come in and assist them when, they're, when, when the states need help. And that's a system that we've trained on, and that's the one that we depend on. And, and some of the programs that we depend on from the federal side of the house actually bring us into state and local communities. We have hospital preparedness programs where we work with the hospitals to do emergency preparedness. We work with medical volunteers through medical reserve corps that are out there. We have the National Disaster Medical System that has disaster medical assistance teams, many of whom were working at the marathon that day. So at the end of the day, as we progress through this evolution of what emergency management really is, it, it becomes more and more an expectation, whether it's in a large city like Boston or New York City or, or a small locality like West Texas. I can tell you that the day after the bombing in Boston, at 3 a.m., I was on the phone with people from West Texas and our regional coordinators out there. And the day before that, we were on the phone with North Dakota. So there's, there's a, a bigger and stronger collaboration as we move forward in this evolution of where we're trying to achieve success 
through greater collaboration than ever before. Judy Ann Bigme, you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, I think that um, uh, one of the things that um, we have done is to use every disaster, even though they weren't as traumatic as this bombing in Massachusetts, to learn about where the gaps are in our response to emergencies, whether it was the tornadoes out in Western and Central Mass, or the two million people with no water when the water main broke, or the storms um, where there was a lot of discussion about should we shut down public transportation. And after each of those, looking at them and identifying where things didn't work so well helped make it better the next time. And uh, that's a very important process to go through. I also think that Don's point about um, the federal government and states pushing out resources to communities um, so that they have the opportunity to put these types of processes in place and understand how to do it is extremely important. And I believe that that is a very strong role that government needs to take on. I, I have to ask, uh, anyone here want to answer the question that Judy raises? Was there, as we analyze what happened that day, a gap that we need to fill in the response here? Did it work that a little soon, or did it work that perfectly? I, I, I'll, I'll say I'm sure there were gaps. I, I'm sure there are problems. Uh, and um, while we're very proud of, of the successes that we've had in, in, in the response to a terrible event, uh, there's no question that we need to learn lessons and we need to fix systems. Um, what the big problems are and what they need fixing, I don't know that I have perspective enough, enough to say right now. Uh, the, the one thing that I would say uh, is, is actually building a, a bit on, on Judy's comment and, and on, on Don's that, you know, part of the reason we've been able to integrate systems uh, like the Boston system in the last several years is through initiatives uh, like the Hospital Preparedness Program that's, that's run uh, out, of, uh, out of Don's office. Th those, those initiatives, that funding allows hospitals, EMS, others to come together and practice. Um, and um, I think there, there are times that people think that, that we are done, um, that uh, we've reached a point where we're all, uh, we're all trained up and we're ready to go. And I, I, I guess I'd make the analogy that, that um, a football team doesn't stop practicing just because they've, they've played one game. Um, and I'm, I'm worried that um, if we lose the support uh, of um, federal funding programs like ones that are that are in in Don's office and through the CDC and others that, that we won't sustain gains that we've made um, we need to keep practicing together we need to keep working together uh, so that not just other communities but even our own community here in Boston can hopefully affect a better response if, if God forbid something happens again Lenny you're nodding your head yes uh, actually um, I want to s demonstrate where there wasn't a gap and um, we of course had been talking about a multiple bomb, a secondary bomb in Boston, because we had learned from other communities such as Madrid and London and other places that it could happen. And, um, you know, I, Jim, I just was wondering what was going through your mind and those of our colleagues. So here, uh, the possibility of a secondary, a secondary happened. Uh, oftentimes they're directed against emergency medical services. You know, sometimes people can run away. And you had no doubt that there was a possibility of multiple bombs at that point. You closed the gap by running in, and what did you do? You moved people quickly. What, what were you guys thinking? Yeah, I, I think that was it exactly. It was just, uh, okay, we have a li limited amount of time in, in the danger zone, kill zone, what you want to call it. So uh, get, get, get those who are alive out and those who you potentially could survive, get out. Uh, we've, we've taken advantage of, again, as you said, we've had folks from London come over here uh, we've, to, to talk to us after what they experienced. We've had folks from Madrid, we've had folks from Pakistan come in for, uh, for different programs here to, so we can hear it firsthand what they experienced. We've had uh, qu uh, quite a few representatives from Israel who, who dealt with a lot of these uh, you know, over long periods of time. And when we asked them, like, so well, what do you do? You know, we're always told secondary device, watch out. And uh, they told us that uh, Yep, they're probably there, but uh, that's what you signed up for. So just, you know, people are going to go in anyway. So just make a plan. Go in, <laughs> get them out as quick as you can. I mean, but that was their practical people who were living it every day were saying, like, 
it's a calculated risk you got to take, and you do it, and and everybody did, um, is is what I would say. Sorry, I was going to say thank you. Another thing is training and training, like Dr. Bitten just said, and then when we think we're done, we train again. But we make it as realistic as possible too. In other words, uh, tabletop exercises are wonderful, but there's nothing like and um, you know Paul used myself for example. We did a uh, we put on a a full functional exercise a while back where we pretended it was an active shooter thing going on. But when someone in an exercise, you purposely get them into danger, that's what we do. We try and drag them into danger, and then we say, look to your right, and there's a phony device we've planted there ourselves. And they see it, and you can see the look on their faces, that realization, oh my, that's right, if this had been a real incident, you'd be dead now. Mm -hmm. And that realistic training, it brings it home. We had more than, I had uh, two dozen people at least come to me afterwards saying, you know, for a brief moment, I didn't know what to do, and then the training kicked in. And I remembered everything we did in the classroom, everything we did in the exercise. And that was uh, validation for us, at least. Lieutenant, you have uh, a, pretty, uh, a pretty hefty audience in terms of influence here. You've got your boss. You have, uh, you have, <laughs> you have people on the state uh, and, and national level listening to you right now. And who knows who's listening uh, on the other end of the webcast. W what do you need out in the field that you don't necessarily have now? Or what do you need more of? Well, first, Bob, thanks for taking the pressure off. <laughs> uh, what do I need? Uh, actually, it's interesting because we do so much training. When we go out into communities and we train, uh, because again, we teach all of Eastern Massachusetts, some communities will go to, and the very first class you teach, you see just you know the boots on the ground type. Uh, inevitably, those systems don't work. We'll go to another community, and the first people in the class, in the very first class, they're all the commanders and the directors and the executive level people. You know this is going to work because now the regular staff sees there's a buy-in. And that's really all it takes is that attitude that my boss believes in this and has sent me to this training, but my boss took the training too. Uh, so I'm, I would encourage the managers, the executive level people, get some training and then your staff will say, you know, lead by example, if you would. So actually, I, I, I would just say, again, to the executive level people, sell it. You have to take this course yourself. Chief. Well, I was going to say, uh, similar to what Dr. Bittinger was saying, as far as uh, if you want to avoid gaps, is we want to be able to sustain this. And uh, we, we, we've been fortunate in, uh, in that, uh, I know in Boston, the mayor's office, emergency preparedness, uh, in, in, and in Massachusetts, a lot of these programs that were available for terrorism preparedness, disaster preparedness, uh, they've always insisted on keeping the hospitals, healthcare, EMS systems involved. I mean, obviously a lot of it has to be law enforcement centric. I understand that. We all saw what that happened, how that played out. But there's always been some insistence that uh, local uh, you know, hospitals, uh, systems, uh, have to have a seat at the table. When, when Boston, the last two years when Boston uh, prepared for this Urban Shield exercise, which uh, the mayor's office uh, funded for us uh, through a Iwasi grant, uh, which involved terrorism, which involved explosions, which involved you name it, over the, the two different uh, um, exercises. Uh, the hospitals, the disaster preparedness people, uh, folks from the state, they all had a seat at the table and doing them. They had as much involvement in planning and executing that exercise as those of us wearing uniforms. And I think that was very important. And you know, we had to keep, uh, hopefully, the funding coming in for that. And then we need response capability. Uh, there's a limited numbers of ambulances out there in the community. And uh, we, we, we have to make sure that we keep them staffed. Lenny, let me ask you, uh, you work with the White House uh, on emergency preparedness. Does this White House understand the need for funding and is it acting on it as best it can at a time when we're dealing with federal sequester budget cuts and tight state and local budgets? Well, certainly these are tough times. Um, there is a resilience policy directorate in the White House. I had an opportunity to meet with those folks earlier this week. And, and, and it really goes back to what we've seen here in Boston. Boston has set a standard, and we're hoping... You call it the Boston standard. I call it the Boston standard. Boston has set a standard, and I think uh, we need to go up to the hill. Congress needs to understand that this is not the moment for playing the sequestration games. This is the moment to, to, go, to learn what happened here and to ensure wherever this would happen, across the United States that communities could meet the Boston standard. People expect that. Lives were saved 
by our colleagues and by their colleagues. And I think we should expect that whether it's a terrorist event or a natural event like a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake, that we would see the same kind of response in every community across the country. But realistically, uh, Congress uh, is arguing about whether in some cases there should be uh, assistance to uh, Hurricane Sandy victims. We saw that just a few months ago. So it, politically, do you feel that, there's, w that this is possible or that there'll be resistance to this? I think we need to, to go up to the Hill. I had an opportunity to speak to folks in the Senate Homeland Security uh, Committee this week as well. They're beginning to understand that people expect something from their government. And this is exactly what we all expect. We all have to be singing the same song. I think we in Boston have this very immediate experience. We have to share it with our colleagues across the country. I think we have to share it with people on the Hill. And it's time for our country to wake up. We had the wake-up call on 9-11, and that certainly there were a lot of changes, and Congress funded a lot of changes post-9-11. This is another wake-up call, and we have, to, we have to pay attention to the message. Uh, why, don't we, why, don't we take a quick, uh, why don't we take a quick survey of uh, final comments here? And Don, uh, you're joining us from Washington. Why don't we start with you? Okay, thank you. I, actually, I, I really appreciate the fact that you asked all the political questions to Lenny. That, that's <laughs> most appreciated. Um, I do want to go back and, and answer a question that you asked, and I didn't want to interrupt the panelists, but when you, when you and many asked the question now, during, during the event in Boston, everybody was appreciative of the work that was done. And then it always seems that shortly thereafter, the microscope turns to the responders and whether or not things could have been done better. I think, I think what I would suggest is that we step back away from all of the details and think about what happened. Within seconds, people that got hurt had medical care. Within seconds, there was communication to the people that needed to understand what was going on so that they would be able to secure the environment. Within minutes, patients got to hospitals. Within minutes, patients were cleared out of emergency rooms so that they would be able to accommodate incoming patients that needed emergency services more. Minutes after that, they were in operating suites. I think there's always room to improve. There is no finish line, no pun intended, this being the marathon day, but there is no finish line to emergency management and preparedness. When we think we're done, like Paul said, that's the time that we go back and start over and learn all of the lessons that have accrued from the time that we started it first to the time we ended. It's an ongoing process, and there's not a moment to lose between when we think we're done and when we start again in preparedness. And the, the final statement I'll make is that, that I, I've been very clear that the, the city, state, locals, volunteers, private services are learning to work better and better together. I can tell you that on the federal side of the house, having been both at the city level and the state level, I'm now engaged with the Department of Defense and federal agencies that are talking and training about how to provide services to cities and states in need. I think we're in a very, very good place, and that can only improve from here. So with all of the things that Lenny's doing at the Hill and, and with all the political connectivity that we have, I think that's where the energy and the emphasis and the funding needs to go so that we are better prepared when we come to the next event, which, as Jim said, it will definitely happen, whether it be natural or man-made. We're in this business. Things have changed, and we're going to continue to do what we do. The hope is that we continue to get better at it with every turn. So right. thank you for having this panel. Thank you for inviting me. And, and barring any questions, I'll, I'll be quiet and let you finish off now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Don. Mary, one final observation from you. Sure. I'd, I'd like to build on what Don said, and I'd be remiss with Don on, on the line. Um, not to underscore the importance of the federal support and the federal funding, that has allowed us to push out exercises and to build exercises with the hospitals and with EMS and with state emergency management and all of the players who are involved in this. Um, and we as a state rely on that, we as local communities rely on that, and I can't, um, I can't underscore enough the importance and the benefit of that federal support for what we've done um, and the importance of its continuation because we do need to continue doing these exercises and building on the successes that we saw here and identifying the places where we can get better because we can always get better. Okay, Judy Ann Bigby. Um, I just wanna emphasize how important it is to develop relationships 
in the non-emergency times. People that need to work together, you can have the best exercises, you can have the best plans, but if the first time they talk to each other is on the day of the disaster, um, it's going to be very challenging. So both horizontally and vertically, it's important for people to know somebody that they're likely to be working with and to have confidence in that relationship. Paul Bittinger. Same theme, I hate to say. Uh, it, it, we, we're all a team. Um, had, had we not worked with Chief Hooley and his department, had within my hospital, uh, we not worked with our admitting office, but also our respiratory therapists, even our environmental services folks who are instrumental in moving things around and helping us, helping us respond. Th there is no uh, part of the health system that's not part of the team for disaster response. And um, whether uh, it's a mass casualty event like we experienced or the hurricane, uh, everyone needs a seat at the table, uh, and, and that's community health centers, that's long-term care facilities. Um, we've had a, a culture of uh, inclusiveness in our health sector preparedness here, uh, and I, I would encourage everyone to, to uh, continue that spirit in their own, uh, in their own uh, venue. Um, I, I think it's fundamental to what we do. Chief Hooley. Well, <clears throat> yeah. Don was saying that if you, if you look at the overall thing, uh, that it's, you know, it, we felt like it was a success, and that, and again, with all, all uh, consideration of the victims who are, you know, have a lot ahead of them. But, okay, so we were successful as, as, a, as a community, as the city of Boston, as EMS, uh, and the hospitals. Uh, but now, uh, we, so we, but unfortunately, we've also raised the bar pretty high now. So this is now expected, even, even for us, in, in my department, uh, we, we just set a pretty high standard for ourselves uh, to maintain. And now we have to go, uh, go about thinking like, how are we going to be able to sustain that? How are we going to be able to uh, meet the next challenge and the new challenge when it's uh, at an off uh, different hours of the day, when we don't have 300 medical volunteers down the street, when uh, all hospitals aren't standing by and stuff like that. So there'll, there'll be other challenges we have to worry about. And so we're just going to have to redouble our efforts because, you know, uh, we know what the price of not preparing, well, we suspect what the price of not preparing would have been. Um, we, I, I'm sure the, uh, the situation would have been worse. So we just have to uh, be able to maintain a posture and that's... Uh, All right. That's what I get. Lenny Marcus, uh, since I, since I uh, opened last with you, let me close with you. Will the tragedy of the Boston Marathon bombing, but the wonderful, uh, successful response to it wind up being the national catalyst for change in terms of emergency response across America. I hope that it will, and I hope that we recognize as a country and as individual citizens that when something like this happens, you're it. If you're on the sidewalk and someone needs your help, you're it. You, you're there to help them. If you're EMS, and there's a job to do, you're it, you're going to jump in and you're going to do that. And if you're in a leadership position, whether um, on the street or in a hospital, you have that responsibility. And I think if we as a country, if we as a community, as we as individuals, maintain that responsibility, we will continue to be resilient no matter who outside or who inside wants to try and interrupt us and interrupt our lifestyle. All right. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here today for this important discussion. I'd like to thank the uh, Forum at the Harvard School of Public Health for hosting it. Uh, today's session, again, the Boston Marathon bombings, lessons learned for saving lives. Dean Frank, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I very much enjoyed this discussion. A closing reminder that you can continue this conversation right now at Forum hsph.org. I'm Bob Oaks from WBUR. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.